In the RV podcast this week, we talk about... Guided RV tours. Are they right for you? Should e-bikes be allowed in national parks? A great make-ahead camping food recipe to save you time. And expert tips on keeping your RV plumbing system working properly. All that and more coming up on episode 453 of the RV Podcast. Hello, everybody. I'm Mike Wendlin, and this is my lifelong traveling companion and my bride, Jennifer. And welcome to episode 453 of the RV podcast. I'm still a little tired from last week. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it was a busy week, but a fun week. We are just back from our summer gathering. We called it our meetup at Mackinac. We were up at the tip of the Michigan Mitt at Mackinac City, Michigan, near Mackinac Island. And uh, we put up a big photo montage of, of this gathering up on our YouTube channel, and you can check that out. But what a great time. Um, we do uh, several meetups a year, and the next one is in the fall. But my goodness, that is sold out already. Yeah, it's going to be the Music City Meetup, October 2nd to the 5th in Nashville, Tennessee. Now, it is sold out, but there are always a couple of cancellations as we get closer to the date, you know, and people uh, uh, change their plans and stuff so when we uh, get ready for that we will uh, look forward to having you guys uh, uh, jump right in and uh, and let you know and well, you can pick up some of those cancellation tickets and it should be pretty good so what do you think uh, tickets for the Grand Old Opry is that what uh, everybody is so excited about it I walking think... around touring uh, downtown Nashville and taking in some of the historic sites that are in the area how about awesome shopping yeah. Big yep. city, awesome shopping. Yep, Nashville is a lot of fun, and I think everybody is going to really enjoy it. Um, boy, it has been a uh, uh, a busy summer, and because of that, we're doing a little switch up on Sunday nights. Our normal Sunday night Ask Us Anything program, we're going to take a break for the summer. And we, we did this because at 7 o'clock Eastern time, when we usually go on the air, um, it's still light outside. Mm -hmm. Everybody's out walking around, taking hikes, riding their bike. They're outside so, having fun. So we thought that we would uh, just take the summer off and give ourselves a little break. And then uh, we'll pick it up again as uh, fall and uh, comes and it gets dark a little bit earlier. We might have a couple of uh, live updates between now and then. But basically, uh, uh, we'll uh, let everybody know on our social media platforms when there's one scheduled. But we'll pick that up in the fall because we do enjoy it. We do. And we're going to miss you all. Yeah. But um, there's always, of course, the podcast, our regular videos, and daily content at RVLifestyle.com. That is our blog. And we hope that you guys will uh, check that every day rvlifestyle.com speaking of things to check something else you should check is our uh, rv lifestyle facebook group it is uh, 190,000 plus members now we're pushing 200,000 members and if you have not checked that or you're not a member you really should plug yourself in because that's probably the best way that we know of to be really informed and get help uh, as as you have questions about the rv lifestyle wendy boyer and her team uh, handle most of the posts and uh, keep it moderated and uh, keep their tabs on it. And uh, she just does a great job. And she uh, does a weekly social media buzz segment for us. And here she is with what we've been talking about on the Facebook group this week. Hi, everybody. It's Wendy Boyer from the RV Lifestyle Facebook group. And boy, has our group been busy lately because everybody's out there traveling. And we're getting lots of questions, like one from Sarah. Sarah said she's had her travel trailer for a little over a year. And her question was, how can I keep my trailer cool while we're driving on the road? She said that they're driving in really hot temperatures. It's in the 90s when they pull over at 6 o'clock. And they want to be able to get inside, cook dinner, rest, not feel like they're stepping into an oven. So she asked this question and got so many helpful suggestions. A few included cover your windows and skylight with Reflexit while you're out there traveling. Others said as soon as you get to your destination for the night, turn on your air conditioner full blast before you set up the rest of your unit. 
And then just a real great tip was when it's that warm, don't even try to cook inside your trailer. Cook outside. And there were many other suggestions too. It was a great question and certainly many of us are dealing with that sort of heat. Another thing I'd like to share with you is a tip because who doesn't need a good tip, right? And Allison had such a great tip to share. She said she's always on the lookout for storage ideas for all of her gear. So last winter, she bought a 25 inch wreath box and she's out there for the first time using it to store a 50 foot heated hose. She just wrapped her hose inside the wreath box and it was a great hack. Lots of people liked it saying things like, brilliant, great idea. So thanks for sharing that, Allison. And then finally, there was a picture I just had to share with you all. It came from Clark, who was camping at Zion National Park. He was out for a day, he walked back to his campsite, and Clark has a big Class A, so picture those big windows from the Class A. And he looked at that window, and it looked like someone had come when he was gone and painted his window. In fact, he wrote, who did this? And that was his first thought. And what he saw was this incredibly gorgeous um, desert scene. And he realized what he was looking at was a reflection on his window. The light was perfect and it was just stunningly beautiful. Um, hundreds of people commented on it, shared it. And uh, Beverly said, you know, it doesn't get much better than this. So happy traveling to all of you out there, and I'll see you next week in the RV Lifestyle Facebook group. It's always fun to hear what Wendy has to share, what everybody's been talking about, the highlights, the things that catch her attention. You can learn so much uh, by being part of that group. And now for something fun, something everybody likes. It has to do with eating. <laughs> we have a recipe section to our podcast yes it's the uh, campingfoodrecipes.com that's our uh, one of our, our blogs our sister blog it's de dedicated strictly to helping you prepare meals for camping and uh, easy ways good meals excellent uh, uh, tasting things that you can share with your uh, camping crew and uh, Jerrica Ma is the editor of campingfoodsrecipes.com uh, and she's got a great one for a great uh, prepare ahead meal for us this week Hi Camping Foodies, Jerrica here from CampingFoodRecipes.com and this week I'm coming to you from my home kitchen because I have a make-ahead recipe for you. And this is a favorite for grandparents and parents um, who have little ones who are big fans of the Smucker's Uncrustable sandwiches. On our website we have a DIY version of those Uncrustables uh, that you can make at home with just a simple affordable tool from Amazon. Um, and it's, it's great for camping trips because you can make as many as you want in advance, pop them in your home freezer, and then whenever you're ready to go camping, you just move them over to your, uh, to your RV freezer. And then once you're out on the campsite, ready to have lunch, you just take them out, pop them in the microwave for 30 seconds, or just take them out maybe about 30 minutes before you're ready to eat, and then you have these ready-made PB&Js wherever you go. So they're really a great, simple option, and the best part is they're significantly cheaper to make than to buy. Um, so you'll be saving money and have the added convenience of those nice little Uncrustable sandwiches. So be sure to go to our website to check those out, and please don't forget that you can also submit your own favorite camping recipes through our Submit a Recipe tab on our website. We would love to see uh, what recipes you take with you wherever you camp. So that's it for me this week. I'll see you next week with our favorite camping recipe of the week. Well, Mike, all I got to say is that was some excellent tips. I have never thought about making peanut butter and jelly sandwiches and freezing them. <laughs> so um, we do like I me. like peanut butter and jelly. Yeah, sandwiches. you are more of a peanut butter and jelly person than I am. But I'm going to make some of those up. Usually I'm making them in the back of the rig as we're bouncing down the road. <laughs> <laughs> trying to get a little something so we don't have to stop and eat fast food. But yeah. if you've got kids, grandkids, I can see where this would be a, a great asset to make ahead of time. And uh, if you want some other uh, food ideas, uh, go to CampingFoodRecipes.com. Lots of neat food ideas for you to check right there. All right, when we come back, our interview of the week, and we're going to talk about a guided RV tour. You ever, been wonder, you ever wondered what that is like, where it goes, how it works? Stick with us because we're going to uh, learn all about whether a guided RV tour 
is right for you. Stay with us. The one thing that can ruin a perfect RV trip is a bad mattress. And believe us, we know over the years, we've tried many and found them all wanting until now. Now we sleep on the RV mattress by Brooklyn Bedding. Quite simply, it's the best we've ever slept on. We chose a queen-sized Aurora Lux medium firm mattress that arrived tightly rolled in a box. All we had to do is put it on the bed, unroll it, and wait for it to recover from the compression. Then we put the sheets and the bed covers on, and we found we slept so well on it that we ordered another one for our home. That's how comfortable it is. Our sleep is now so luxurious and deep that we can't imagine using a different mattress. Shipping is free, and if you're disappointed with the current mattress in your RV, you owe it to yourselves to try the RV mattress by Brooklyn Bedding. Brooklyn Bedding sends out all of their RV mattresses from their own factory in Arizona. That means they're able to use premium materials at a reasonable price for you with no middleman bringing up the cost. And right now, if you visit rvmattress.com slash RV lifestyle, you'll get the maximum discount off your mattress with the promo code RV lifestyle. Again, use the promo code RV lifestyle for a big discount on your RV mattress by Brooklyn Bedding. We're sure you'll be as thrilled with your RV mattress by Brooklyn Bedding as we are with ours. It really is the most comfortable mattress we've ever slept on. Welcome back. Um, you know, I should point out that uh, we, we like those RV mattresses so much that uh, at the uh, house on our Michigan property that we've been remodeled, we just ordered two of them for our guest bedroom. So A couple of we, twin bed mattresses. Yeah, we have them in our, our main bed. Uh, we have a king for that. We've got uh, one in our RV, and then now we just added a couple of them. They really are comfortable mattresses. We do enjoy them. All right, it's time now for the interview of the week segment, and this is one that that uh, I have been curious about for a long time. So I am really glad that we can uh, share what we learned about RV touring companies. And we have people often ask us, asking us if we'll do like a trip to Alaska or something so that you're not overwhelmed with all that planning that you need to do. So these companies, it really is going to be great to hear this. Yeah, um, we would love to do one of those sometimes, but mm -hmm. there's already uh, there's a number of RV touring companies, but one of them, Fantasy RV Tours, probably the biggest out there. It's been around with for you know 40 years of experience in running guided tours. And um, it's very interesting how these work. We've run across Fantasy RV Tours in our travels, where we've stayed at a campground that they have been in, or we've passed them on the road, or we've seen them at one of the cool sites. They're, they're a really neat operation. And I think it says a lot that they've been around for 40 years. I mean, they have had time to figure out the best places to go and to work the bugs out. And man, do they go to some cool places. So we thought we would ask them to come on the podcast and talk about what a, a guided tour is like so we can find out if it's right for us. And Stacy Raybung is their operations manager and she is our guest and joins us right now. Thank you very much. I'm excited to be with you. So let's start off by talking about what uh, an RV touring company does. Okay, well, um, for us, we are uh, pretty much the world's largest RV um, provider of guided RV tours or guided RV vacations. So in a nutshell, we do all the work and you show up and let us take care of you on your RV vacation. So we, are, we book all the reservations, take care of everything for you. Everything is included. Um, for you, uh, maybe an exception of a meal, a few meals that might be on your own, but um, gratuities, trip planning, all of the, all of that is taken care of for you, and that's what RV tour caravan companies do. Now, um, we've seen uh, tours that you can take, you know, to exotic locations where you get on a bus and they take you everywhere. 
you're kind of the same thing, except we're driving in our RVs and camping in our RVs, right? Exactly. Kind of like the, what you're talking about, maybe a fly-in and fly-out kind of uh, location. We do the same things, um, except you are driving your own RV to that location. And then we bring a bus in and take you out to all of the different places and the things to see, the restaurants and um, bucket list locations. Uh, is there any particular type of RV that you are limited to? Can do you have everything from towables to motorhomes, or are they all motorhomes? As long as it's self-contained, we um, will accept it. We have a lot of towables that go along. We even have a few truck campers that have uh, joined us on some of our tours. So anything from a uh, truck camper all the way up to a 45-foot diesel pusher. Well, how many RVers are on a typical tour? I've seen you before. I think I saw one of yours in, uh, oh gosh, I want to say it was at a campground in Natchez, Mississippi, across from there a few years ago. And I was really impressed. They all came in and they all had a good time. We ran into them in town. Uh -huh. uh, but how many do, do you normally have? Typically on a moving caravan, um, we have 22 guest rigs and two ambassador rigs so we'll have a wagon master and a tail gunner and of course the wagon master is the leader the tail gunner runs behind everybody else in case somebody has an issue while they're on the road and um, so it's typically 24 total rigs counting those two ambassadors now um how, how are some of your trips organized? Where's your most popular locations? Give us an idea of what you would do on a on a tour, on an RV tour like this. Um, well, it's important to uh, designate that a caravan moves. A caravan um, is different from a rally because a rally stays in one location, but a caravan will move. And our most popular location is Alaska, without a doubt. Um, we are running 13 different caravans to Alaska this summer. In fact, we just got three on the road this past week. So we have three tours out, 10 more to go <laughs> this summer. And um, you will arrive at your location. Usually we stay at the rally point, which is your arriving location. You're responsible for getting to that spot. Once you get there, Wagon Master will take care of the rest and give you all your information. You'll have an itinerary uh, before you go that'll be emailed to you. Um, and you'll get a book with driving directions. And uh, usually we'll stay a couple of days, have a welcome dinner, get to know each other. And then, the, and then we take off and we head off to um, say we're going to Alaska we head off across the border. Our wagon master goes first. The tail gunner goes last. And we wait till everybody gets across the border and then uh, take off to our first campground. So uh, how many miles do you typically go in a day? Uh, we try extremely hard never to drive more than 300 miles in a day. Um, in Alaska, sometimes 300 miles is a little longer than it would be in the United States. So we uh, typically keep everything under 300 miles unless it's just impossible um, in some of the remote areas of Alaska. I think there's one driving day on our 60-day Alaska tour that's like 350 miles. Wow. That's what I was going to ask is, is how long is the Alaska tour? But you have other tours. Tell us about some of your other locations that you go to. Um, we Another popular location is obviously the Canadian Maritimes. Uh, we do all um, about 10 uh, tours through the Maritimes, some just to the lower provinces and some go all the way up to uh, Newfoundland. So um kind of depends on how much time you have and what you want to see. Another great one, like you mentioned, you saw our group at Natchez. That um, is our Mississippi River Run Tour. Starts um, up in um, at the top of the Mississippi River and drives all the way down to the bottom of the Mississippi River in New Orleans. And um, it follows the river. The, there's a road called the Great River Road. And it follows, so it follows that road all the way down. That's another, and that's a 34-day caravan. And, and a, how long are your typical caravans? What do they range from? We, in go, time to we have any, we have our shortest caravan is um, our 13-day uh, Made in America music tour, which just does three locations. And our longest caravan is a 62-day Alaska tour. Now, um do they start typically in one location and then do they return to that location? Can people join it at different points? How does that all work? 
That's a good question. Uh, sometimes we start um, in the same in one location and we end in well, we almost always end in another location. Um, maybe if we're talking about Alaska, we have some different itineraries. Some that start in the United States and end in the United States. Some of them start in the United States and end in Prince George, British Columbia, and the and you get yourself back to wherever you want to go. So do we? We don't ever end up at the same exact campground that we started at. Um, obviously, on something like the Mississippi River Run, you're going to start up in Minnesota and you're going to end in New Orleans. So we're not going to go back to Minnesota. Now, uh, does uh, this is the image I used to have of it, and I don't think it's accurate. But uh, does everybody have to travel, you know, like nose to trail along the whole route? Can you stop at your will? You just have to get to the campground at a certain time. How does that work? Absolutely not. We do not go. We don't want everybody to travel nose to tail because then the person in the front of it is the only one that sees anything. So um, we have it uh, structured that this is your vacation. We we're going to tell you that our wagon master is going to leave at. 7 a.m. to get to the next campground to get everything ready. You are welcome to leave any time between 8 a.m. or 7 a.m. and when the campground checkout is, which is usually noon, 11 o'clock or noon. So people can get up and move at their own leisure, and the tail gunner is going to stay in that campground until the last rig has left. And um, so, and if there's something, we'll give you suggested things to stop and see along the way, um, especially. Um, I hate to keep going back to Alaska, but in Alaska, there's a lots of um, places where you want to pull off to the side and take a picture. You want to see, you want to stop and get the world's largest cinnamon roll. You, we're going to tell you all those places to stop and do those things. And, um, you know, maybe we even have people who want to uh, go see a brother-in-law or a family member that lives in an area nearby. They can go do that. It's their vacation. They just need to let the wagon master know, hey, I'm not going to be in till late tonight. The tail gunner doesn't need to watch for me. I'm going to be doing this instead. Or maybe they want to go hiking or biking on a trail and they want to take a break between and, and, and go do that. That's perfectly fine and encouraged. Now, you mentioned uh, many of the meals are provided. Talk about that for us. Right. On our itinerary, you'll see um, how many meals are provided on, on a caravan or a rally, either one. And um, so we book those for you. It's almost always going to be one meal. Um, I don't want to say per day, but at least one or two meals per stop wherever we are. Sometimes it's a campground meal because there's no... Uh, in a remote location, there's no restaurant that we might be able to go to. So the wagon masters will provide a campground meal. It's not a potluck. We don't have the guests do that. The, wa the wagon masters and the tail gunners will prepare a really nice meal, not just a, not just hamburgers and hot dogs every time either. So, um, so the meals are uh, mostly provided. Obviously, if you have special dietary needs or something like that, you would need to make arrangements for certain restrictions. We do our best to help alleviate those, but we can't always guarantee that there'll be a, um, a restaurant meal that will be completely 100% what everybody needs. <laughs> all right, here's the big question that everybody is listening. They're all going, yeah, yeah, that sounds great. Mm -hmm. Then how much does this cost? Give well, us some price ranges. it depends on which tour you're looking at, obviously. Um, the great thing that I'm just going to say up front is that we like to make our tours affordable for everybody. So we do offer a monthly payment plan that is a no interest monthly payment plan, no credit check. So if it's something somebody really wants to do, we encourage them to take a look at uh, paying it monthly. Uh, most of our tours book out about two years in advance. So that really does make it kind of affordable if you want to go on a 60-day Alaska tour, um, you can do payments for the next 24 months on that, which makes it much more affordable. If you're looking at something like our uh, Made in America music tour, we're talking about you know around $5,000 for that caravan for two people. If you are looking at a 60-day Alaska tour for 2025, we're looking at about $15,000 for two people in an RV. Again, yeah. 
It's a but long time. You're on the road a lot. That's your meals and it's your camp fees. It's, yeah. it's every camping reservation. It's all the excursions. It's like um, if you think about a cruise and you go on a cruise and you go on these excursions, those are all extra charges. You have to pay an extra fee to go on that. These are all included for you. We're going to take you to the most iconic things that you've ever heard about going to Alaska. We're going to take you on the White Pass train. We're going to take you down into Skagway and let you see <laughs> let you see the gold rush. And we're going to take you to Chicken, Alaska, where you can you know actually pan for gold on your own. And um, all the iconic things that you want to do. You want to see wildlife, we're going to take you on multiple boat cruises, and those are all going to be included. And the gratuities for those vendors are included also. So you're not expected to tip a whitewater rafting captain or any of those things. Now, uh, this is, uh, get winding down here, um, I, I've interviewed people before who have become uh, junkies of uh, these tours. They do them year after year after year. And and that's how we actually decided. Hey, let's let's get them on the program. Uh, we talked to a, a woman just a couple of weeks ago who does two of them a year. She says. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm curious. Do people do them always with friends? Do they do them? Uh, what about solos? Uh, do you, I would imagine you become good friends with people camping, you know, uh, off them, but. Who normally goes on? They go with friends usually. One of the one of the big things everybody always tells us that they love about the RV caravan lifestyle is that they make friends that become family, and they have reunions later wherever they all are. They the whole group might end up in Florida for the winter, and they'll have a little reunion and get together. So um, a lot of people come along the first time on their own. And then they make friends on the tour and they book something else while they're all on the tour and they all book it together. They're all like, okay, well, let's go to the Maritimes next year or let's go to Mexico next year. So, and they all book it together and then they travel together and they become traveling partners and they start traveling together. Um, sometimes at a show, like with you've said, you've mentioned you've seen us at conventions and there'll be a group of people that are there together and they'll come up and they'll say, we all want to go on this tour together. But Generally speaking, most people book on their own the first time, and then they find people they like to travel with. That's great. Uh, last question. Um, you, you, a typical day, do you usually you get into a campground? How long do you usually stay at a, wherever you're camping? Uh, you, I think you said a couple of days, but uh, do you have time to, you know, you have time to unwind and see the area? Depending on the location, if there's something to see, sometimes we're driving just to get to a location and it might be a two day drive. So we might just stay one night and just, you know, hunker down for one night, feed everybody and have a campground social and then move on the next morning. Normally we're in a location for at least two to four days. And if it's a bigger location, like when we get to uh, Denali, we may be there five days um, so that everybody can explore and do what they want to do. Plus, we we try to give everybody a free day in a location so that they can do after we've shown them the city or the town. And then they can do what they would like to do on their own if they because um, we have different people of different ability levels. Some people want to bike and hike. Some people want to go see museums. So we try to vary it up for everybody. I actually do have one more question, and I, uh, I, for all the worry warts out there, uh, you mentioned you have a tail gunner who kind of, uh, kind of, we, in biking we used to call them sag wagons, but mm -hmm. people who were there in case you had a breakdown and stuff, do do they have like uh, a list and they say, oh well, we've been through this area, we know here are wreckers that can help, here are garages, here's where you know need to go to get something fixed. Uh, what kind of help do they have uh, for that? Absolutely. We have um, the, the benefit of going with an RV caravan company is that we've been there before and we passed this. Uh, we've been going to Alaska for over 20 years. So we pass this information down amongst the wagon masters every year and the tail gunners. So if you do break down, we're going to have information for you to help you, a reputable company that can come and help you. And our tail gunners are even going to stay with you until we know help is on the way. Um, sometimes the tail gunner is able to fix it. It kind of depends. They're not mechanically inclined and they're not going to touch your rig. Um, if not, if they don't want it to be touched, obviously, but they can advise and they can help and maybe you, sometimes they can get it back together and get on the road too. You can get to the campground and get 
um, and get service available there. So yes, we do have that information available. And you're, and you're not alone, which is really good. That's yeah, the yeah. comforting yeah. part is that somebody, you know, somebody's watching out for you and especially in remote locations, there might not be great cell phone service. There might not be, uh, you know, and it's great that even if the tail gunner can't um, get service, they can drive. They can unhook their tow vehicle and go find, get help. You know? So, gotcha. Well, sign us up. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm all excited. I think this will be fun. All right, Stacy, thank you very much. And uh, tell everybody where they can learn more about uh, Fantasy Tours and, uh, and get uh, all the information they need. Uh, we have a website, fantasyrvtours.com, and of course, we have a YouTube channel. If you would like to go there, just search for Fantasy RV Tours, and you will find all kinds of videos and informational um, seminars and presentations that we've done. We will put links to all of them in the description below. And um, Stacy, I look forward to talking to you again about us maybe doing one of these okay. tours. So, thank we'll you. make it happen. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay, Mike. I'm sold. <laughs> I am too. Because I don't want to spend hours and hours working and planning. It does. I, I think this sounds like a good way to do it. It is. You know, it's, um, it's expensive. Yeah. But but when you really add up for all the time, all the meals, all the places you're going to go, all the time you spend planning that route, uh, I think it's a pretty good bargain, actually. So um, I don't know. If we can figure out how to work one out with our RV Lifestyle group, uh, we'll share it with you. If you're interested in one, drop us a line. Where would you like to go? Um, some of those tours last, you know, 40, 50 days. Some of them, you know, I don't know if they have any too many shorter. I think they got one that's as long as 60 days. But um, we'll check into it because it really does sound like a lot of it's, fun. It sounds appealing to me. All right. Hey, if you have an e-bike and you wonder about using it in the national park, uh, heads up, you're going to be finding this very interesting coming up in our News of the Week segment when we return. When we're on a road trip, we always seem to find a way to stop at a Camping World Center. There are over 225 Camping World locations across the country, and there's always one close by when we need parts and accessories for our RV or just on a shop. In fact, we have so much fun with uh, Camping World, and as we talk about it as one of our sponsors, they have agreed to offer a 10% discount if you use the coupon code RVLIFESTYLE10. When you buy $99 or more in merchandise, you'll find everything you want from outdoor furniture and appliances, the ones you see us use in our videos and that we talk about here in the podcast. RV extras that include everything from camping chairs to fire pits, electrical accessories, must-have gadgets. Check them all out. And again, don't forget, use the coupon code RVLIFESTYLE10 when you visit CampingWorld.com. Welcome back, everybody. Time now for the RV News of the Week. What do we got this week? Okay, the first story is the National Park Service is seeking the public's input as it considers the future of allowing e-bikes in national parks. Currently, superintendents can decide uh, where e-bikes e are appropriate, typically a rotor trail where traditional bikes are allowed. Now, the NPS is trying to determine what effect e-bikes may have on such things as wildlife, other visitors' happiness experience, and the park's ecology. Public comments are being collected until July 21st. Uh, we really enjoy our e-bikes, and they're a great tool for those who uh, may just need a little boost here and there while bicycling. And they're becoming extremely popular with our viewers. Yeah, we just uh, returned from our, our summer meetup, as we said, at the top of the program. And uh, a lot of people had them, uh, had e-bikes with them, and, and we were in a big campground. They were using them around there. Um, Mackinac Island, where there are no motorized vehicles, there are no e-bikes allowed either uh, uh, for tourists. So uh, a lot of people wish they had had them. But there was a big bike trail right out in front of this campground. Everybody was using their e-bikes on that. So And I like this. The superintendents can decide yes or no, because like Mackinac Island is only 8.2 miles around. So e-bikes, yep. I don't think they're appropriate there. Well, it's a really tragic story, again, about the weather. We seem to be hearing a lot about this this lately. This is another tornado. This one hit the northwest part of Texas last week, killing four people, injuring at least 10. 
and we've seen some photos and had some reports on our RV Lifestyle Facebook group about just devastating damage uh, to RVs and RVers have been hurt and injured. Uh, this tornado came with little or no warning near the small town of Matador, which is southeast of Amarillo. Uh, and it was just really hard hit. The images we saw showed down power lines and flattened buildings. RVs literally shredded by the strong winds. Uh, extremely sad story because um, it's also a good reminder for all of us to pay attention to the weather to camp prepared for emergencies. One of the things that I recommend is if you are in a unit with slides and you have a tornado uh, watch and it really looks like something's coming, consider pulling in those slides, taking up the levelers, and, and maybe even leaving the area. Uh, you just don't want to be in an RV uh, if a tornado is anywhere near that area. It's not a good idea. No, you do not. Yeah. Our, our next story has to do with a decision is expected soon about whether Washington's Mount Rainier National Park should impose a reservation system during the busy summer months to better manage visitors. Mount Rainier gets nearly 2 million visitors a year, 70% of whom arrive in the summer, and most visiting a select number of destinations. At times, people must wait hours in line to enter, and the sheer volume of so many people people in a small window has caused concern about congestion, people stepping off trails and damaging mm. delicate environments. So a decision on a timed entry system is expected later this year. And I've been, that's of course, uh, timed entry have been tried in a lot of other uh, our, our national parks. So, you know, I think it's, it's probably inevitable and it does seem to work during those peak travel times. His story we um, have also been reporting a lot uh, over the last few months. This one was a pretty brazen one, and we're talking about the targeting by thieves of more than a dozen RVs that were awaiting service at a Camping World store in Oklahoma last week. They were stealing catalytic converters out of the motorhomes. They were ripping off tires and TVs. They did this right on the dealer's lot. Uh, the parking lot had a fence around it. The thieves cut through it. Um, we'll link on our uh, show notes to this episode at rvlifestyle.com to a story, but it uh, looks like something like seven catalytic converters, 15 spare tires, five TVs uh, were taken, uh, and that kind of dashes the immediate travel plans of a lot of people. Uh, more and more reports of RVs being targeted at RV dealers that are awaiting service, and often uh, those catalytic converters, you know, they contain rare minerals and that's what crooks are after uh, we've done a couple of stories about how to protect your unit uh, uh, from that from catalytic converter thieves and we will link to those in the show notes that you'll find at rvlifestyle.com slash podcasts look under that tab and you'll uh, you'll be able to find that Okay, hey, now an RV exploded at a Myrtle Beach, South Carolina campground last week injuring a man destroying his RV and damaging two nearby the explosion at Lakewood Family Campground also required one dog to be rescued and another dog ran away, frightened by this large boom the explosion caused. The cause of the explosion is still underway and reports say it could take a week or two to complete the uh, investigation. Meanwhile, this sad event is a good reminder to all of us to do everything we can to stay safe. Mm. And uh, we do not yet yeah, know if the dog who ran away has been found we sure hope so but dogs do regularly get scared run and become lost while camping yep they do all right that's the rv news of the week and when we return we've got the rv tip of the week we're going to talk about understanding and uh, keeping your rv plumbing system working properly stay with us when we're asked what's the most important modification we made to our rv it's an easy answer Battleborn batteries. Battleborn batteries are quality, safe, reliable lithium batteries that allow us to stay out there off the grid longer. Lithium batteries charge faster, they charge fuller, they're longer lasting, they're maintenance free. And Battleborn batteries are protected by a 10 year guarantee. Now, in our case, they just dropped into the existing AGM batteries that we have, and they'll probably be the same on your rig too. 
Battleborn battery experts can get those in your rig just like they did with ours. They can also match you up with the right cabling, the inverter, the charger, the solar controller, everything. Jennifer and I swear by our Battleborn batteries. They allow us to boondock off the grid. Check them out. Go to rvlifestyle.com slash lithium. rvlifestyle.com slash lithium. Welcome back now. And now it's time for the RV tip of the week from certified RV inspector Brenda of Queen Bee RV. And uh, Brenda has a great uh, tip for us this week. And it's something that a lot of people don't spend a lot of time learning about, but they should. So she's going to help you. She's going to quick start your education uh, about your RV's plumbing system. Here's Brenda. Hey guys, I'm coming to you again from the National RV Training Academy where I'm working this week. And I thought I would use one of our practice rigs to bring you another RV tip of the week. And this time I'm talking about the freshwater distribution system, AKA the plumbing system. So I wanna discuss a couple of tips and maintenance ideas and whatnot to help you understand this one better. First of all, there's two ways that we pressurize the plumbing system and get that fresh water to the sinks and the showers and the dishwasher and whatnot. And that is by way of either your city water or your fresh water holding tank and the water pump. So first let's talk about city water. This means that you'd be connecting to a hose bib or a spigot somewhere and you have a hose connected to your city water connection. And then it uses the pressure from the city or county, the municipality, to push water through your whole plumbing system to get to all those sinks and showers that we talked about. And if you've ever been in a campground, you know that the pressure is unreliable and sometimes super excessive, which can be problematic for RVers because the plumbing fittings are rated for about 55 to 65 PSI typically. And if the water pressure exceeds that, you can have you can wreak havoc on those those fittings that could cause a leak and then chasing those leaks down is kind of difficult it's really time consuming and can be costly to repair so a lot of RVers will implement a water pressure regulator much like this I have a couple here this one's kind of one of the low end ones you've seen these before it's really just a metal plate with a small hole in it not much bigger than a pinhole i swear and if you have long hair you know that you're probably not washing your hair with one of these it doesn't let a lot of water through but it will do the trick and protect your your plumbing there's this other type that has a dial on it that you can actually dial in the psi that you you would like to use so this is kind of cool as well and you just connect those um, near the the hose bib that's where everybody usually connects those now let's talk about hoses i've got a couple of these here that you can use for either system because you're going to have to fill your fresh tank or your or you will use this for city water connection so i would connect one end to the hose bib or the spigot the other to city water connection this one's just one of those little low end white potable water potable means that it doesn't have lead then it's and it's safe for human consumption there's also some some other fun ones that are a little easier to store this is kind of cumbersome um, there's the woven fabric type of hoses that are for they're marine grade you see them for boats and campers and they're also for uh, potable water they're safe for uh, human consumption and they're really lightweight and they squish down and you can store them much easier they have aluminum connections on the end i really like those a lot Maybe Make sure that you don't mix the hoses that you're using for potable water with the ones that you would use for your black tank flush. All right, let's talk about, oh, I know one more thing I want to tell you guys. Keep a bunch of these little rubber washers on hand that you see in here. These things leak like crazy. I just keep a packet of those because it just is a nuisance when it's creating a puddle outside. Now let's talk about the fresh tank. The way that you get water into the fresh water holding tank is either by one of these threaded cap fills that this RV has, or you might have a gravity fill. The gravity fill is a little bit bigger hole. You just stick the hose down in there and it feels kind of loose, but that is normal. This threaded cap is just like a garden hose. The way that you know it's full is either by watching your monitor panel. On the gravity fill, water will come gushing back out at you and that is normal. Or if you fill the whole tank, there is an overflow um, opening on the top and it'll just pour out onto the ground. And don't worry, that, that's normal as well. 
So the way that you get water from the fresh tank through the system is your on-demand water pump. So it runs on 12 volts DC, so you're gonna have to make sure that that coach battery stays charged. When you turn it on, when it's, it's called on demand because when you open up a faucet, that is telling the water pump that the pressure is indicative that a human is calling for water and it'll send water through the whole plumbing system. And you'll hear that rumbling noise. Everybody's heard that before. That part's normal. However, if you have the faucets turned off and you hear some intermittent rumbling, that's not normal. And that could indicate that you have a small leak somewhere. So a couple other pro tips, don't travel with a full holding tank. Water weighs about 8.3 pounds per gallon and that stuff is heavy wait and fill up closer to your destination or if you have a little bit of water in your tank for washing hands or using the bathroom while you're traveling that part is good too but make sure that you don't leave the water pump turned on while you're towing or driving if anything happened and one of those faucet handles got knocked open you could have a big water mess when you reach your destinations so i hope those things were helpful hey ladies are you a female rv traveler and do you want to learn more about safety and troubleshooting problems and maintaining your own RV? Well, head over to queenbrv.com, click on events, and you'll get to view the locations of our nationwide women's RV workshop tour. And I hope to see you there. Now back to you, Mike and Jen. There's always so much to learn from Brenda, and it was a good reminder, a simple, th a little thing like just keeping a package of rubber hose washers on hand. Yeah, I've got some. I've had them in a little container. They just, you know, just, it's a little plastic container that you pick up. They're like less than a dollar, and yet they really can help. So, all right, Brenda, thank you so much. She'll be back next week with another RV tip. Right now, it's um, time for our app of the week and the app of the week segment is taken from the pages of newtraveltech.com that's our sister blog which celebrates the many ways technology enhances the entire RV travel experience and and uh, we really have a great app for you this week if you know the, you hear about natural fires about tornado warnings and about disasters or how many times have you been out someplace and you heard sirens and you know, you're in a strange area, and you, is that something I should be concerned about? Well, this is an app and a website that we want to recommend. It's called Broadcastify. And uh, it's like one of those old-fashioned um, scanners, those police scanners. Remember, they had those, you know, decades ago. That was the latest rage. Well, all that's online streaming now, and it lets you tune in to police and EMS and fire uh, even aviation and rail and public service two-way radio broadcasts from something like 7,000 locations around the country. Wow. I think a lot of people would like that. Yeah. You know, you you get curious about stuff and, you know, what's it like? Am I in a safe area? You can turn on this and you can, you know, listen to police dispatches, fire dispatches. Uh, it's free for iOS and Android as an app. Um, and, of course, like most apps, there is a, an upgraded version. I think the free version, you have to listen to like a 30-second commercial when it first starts up. But if you want to get rid of that, you pay 30 bucks a year, and it's a, it's a free app. But it's a great app to have when you travel. Broadcastify. If you have an app that we should check out that's particularly of use to RVers, let us know. Our email address is mikeandjen at rvlifestyle.com. We got the RV questions of the week coming up right after this. Have you had it with overbooked, overcrowded campgrounds? Then check out Harvest Hosts, where RVers can overnight for free at wineries, farms, microbreweries, golf courses, and attractions. Harvest Host is a membership service for those with self-contained RVs looking for unique, beautiful, and peaceful overnight camping experiences across North America. When you become a member of Harvest Host, you can camp for free at all these places. Jennifer and I are Harvest Host members, and we've made so many great memories at Harvest Host locations. There's no charge for camping, and your Harvest Host membership fee is easily made up with just a couple of stays. Plus, you have awesome places to stay. If you use our special affiliate link of rvlifestyle.com slash hh, you'll automatically get 15% off the cost of your membership. That's 15% off. But you must use the special link, rvlifestyle.com slash hh. 
Welcome back to the questions of the week. And this first question is from Rob and Tricia. And their question is, we love our Class C RV, but the source of the biggest frustration is the lock on the door. Sometimes the key fob opens the door, and sometimes it doesn't. A while back, you did a story about changing the center door lock. Can you tell us what you did, what we do, as soon as we get an RV? The last three that we've had, because we've had this frustration that you have, you are experiencing right now, is that we change it out. We change it out with something called the RV lock. That's pretty easy to remember, right? Mm -hmm. RV lock. But I'll link to it. Um, we um, just we have bought three of those for our last three RVs. And I'm, I just changed it out on our, our Class C Lisa Travel Vans uh, Unity. Uh, it, I, had a, I had to enlarge the hole a little bit that the lock comes after removing the original lock. But even if I can do it, anybody can do it. Uh, it's, it was pretty easy to install. But it's, it's great. This, it does have a fob that works all the time, by the way. And it does have a key. But um, the way we do it, 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 the way everybody else I know, have, the reason you like it is you just enter in a, a passcode and you uh, lock it with the passcode or you unlock it. So you don't even have to carry around all your keys with you. It's just really a handy thing to do. It's called the RV Lock. And again, uh, uh, if you just go to rvlifestyle.com slash RV Lock, uh, and we'll link to it in the uh, podcast, you can uh, check it out yourself. It works on motorhomes, fifth wheels. Uh, we've had it on both and uh, even uh, travel trailers. I just can't say enough good things about changing this out. Not having to carry a key and worrying about losing a key is awesome. Yep, it is. RV lock. Check it out. All right, one more question we'll try and get into. It says, um, we are about to become fifth wheel owners and are very excited but with the cost of living in a home so high these days, what is the cost of living like in a fifth wheel traveling the U.S.? And this was from our RV Lifestyle Facebook group from uh, one of our followers called Carrie. It had a lot of people respond, but uh, we see variations of that question all the time. It goes to, you know, hey, I, I'm tired of paying for a house and I want to travel and save money and I want to get an RV and go out and travel. And... Uh, I hate to pour water on on your parade there, but um, it's it's if you want to maintain your same standard of living, and you're not living a, a low standard of living, you know you're living a comfortable living, standard of living, it's going to cost you as much in an RV as it does at a six and bricks house, and that's been our experience in 12 years of RVing, and from the many different full timers that we've talked through. Now there are exceptions. Well, you know, it's what you want in life, uh, what you can afford. I, I can see why you want to give up your sticks and bricks house. It is expensive. Oh, it's so expensive, and everything is just going up. But living in an RV, moving from place to place to place, it's all what you're going to be comfortable with. If you're going to go park in a park that uh, isn't maybe the greatest or maybe it is the greatest one of those you know marginal yeah. quote, trailer park type campgrounds and everything goes up whether you're in a home or you're in an rv we've found that there's not that much money to be saved i mean if you really have to save money and live in an rv you know find the cheapest campground you can mm -hmm. do a lot of mooch docking at relatives you know driveways uh do a lot of boondocking uh, don't go out for dinner. Um, don't travel because gas and fuel cost a ton a lot. Now, if you want to live like that, this probably this blog isn't really for you because that's not what we're about. We're about really going out there and enjoying it. But so if you're going to kind of keep, if you want to keep the same general standard of living that you have, um, it is not that much cheaper to live in an RV. It's a lot more fun sometimes, <laughs> and uh, a lot. It's a great idea for a, you know. Most people don't do it forever either. You know, they said a few years. Uh, uh, what's the story? Remember the guy that bought one for a year? He, he yeah. used it for six months and six then he months. sold it because his wife. They did what they wanted to do, and they said we don't need it anymore, and, he came and back so and they it. sold it. But yeah. I don't know if they sold their home or not. Yeah. You know, to do that. We don't recommend selling your home unless you have lived in your RV for extended periods of time, so that you know that you want to do it. But uh, you know, uh, there are all trade-offs and everything in life. But in general, it is it is going to cost you pretty close to whatever you're paying now for your house. To maintain in your RV, and there'll be more headaches. I mean, what do you do if something goes wrong with your RV and you have to get it fixed? 
In your house, you can usually have somebody come in and fix it while you live in it. But in an RV, you usually have to take it to a dealer, and they don't let you live in it while you're there. So you're going to have to have a hotel room or find someplace else to stay. And something that you say, RVs aren't made to be lived in full time. They are not. They're not. That's and right. Look in the manual that you get. It's not... They're not certified to be lived in full time. And if you stay in one spot, I can tell you that costs are going to go up just like in a house. You know, the rental for the spot that you're on and utilities and everything. Everything goes up. Nothing yep. goes down. Nothing goes down. So you need to really do your due diligence about where and how you're going to do that. And uh, uh, by all means, go out and enjoy it. But uh, don't jump into thinking that it's going to be cheaper because most of the time it's not. You got a comment on this? Maybe you want to disagree with us, or maybe you do agree and want to share your opinion. We'd love to hear that. Or if you have a question you'd like us to answer on the RV podcast, our personal email is Mike and Jen at RVLifestyle.com. All right, that's it for this week. We'll be back next week with more. Thanks so much. Don't forget to check out RVLifestyle.com for your daily blog posts. Happy trails.